In our previous episode, detailing the lives of the children of Hurin, we provided a brief glimpse into the early life of Turin and the dark cloud which hung about all that he sought to achieve. The curse of Morgoth was to affect him until his dying day, yet the events we have covered up until this point provide but a drop in the ocean of the death and destruction which was to follow in the footsteps of the House of Hador's science. In this episode, we will continue talking about the travels of Turin Turamba and how they influenced the Middle-earth of the First Era. It's only the finest adventures such as these that the Chroniclers record, and we'd like to bring you another story from another universe as well, courtesy of our sponsor Relentless. Relentless is the beginning of an epic fantasy series that will not only be familiar to D&D players, but is actually a novelization of a huge five-year D&D campaign the author was part of, this author being Amazon bestseller Paddy Finn. The story features wild encounters, larger-than-life characters, and plenty of the general shenanigans that a D&D campaign quite literally brings to the table. Follow half-orc Yavanna's vengeful quest across a magical world, with of course a band of unlikely companions with a strange link to the fate of the world itself. The book is launching on Kickstarter, with digital, paperback, and signed hardcover versions available, and if you back the project, you'll also get the Grim Tidings Fantasy Anthology as a free gift. It makes the perfect thing to tide you over while waiting for your next game, or if you haven't played, see the kinds of wild adventures that seasoned players have crafted. Check it all out via the link in the description. In the aftermath of the Battle of the Halls of Ransom and the death of Andrug, Beleg sought out Turin among the dead to give him a fitting burial. When he realized that his old friend was not among the slain, Strongbow deemed a flicker of hope yet remained to him. Beleg tracked the orcs to the highlands of Tower Nufuin, where he came upon a sleeping elf Gwyndor, the son of Gwilin, an escaped slave of Angband after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, brought low by the vile machinations of the torturers of the Dark Lord. Gwyndor informed Beleg of a small company of orcs just ahead of them. The broken elf attempted to dissuade Beleg from pursuit, however the latter would not leave his friend to his fate. Beleg continued onwards until he came across the Camp of the Orcs, who now carousd in celebration of their victory and set out only wolf sentinels to alert them of any oncoming foe. A great storm came from the far west, disguising the ambitions of Beleg and Gwyndor. In the brutal darkness of the night, Beleg shot dead four of the wolf sentries to the southern side of the encampment, before making his way into the camp and slaughtering those who were awoken by their entrance. Gwyndor and Beleg bore the fettered Turin from the campsite. As Beleg began to cut loose the bond which kept Turin, the blade Anglachel bit into Turin's foot. Turin immediately sprung upon his would-be assailant, slaying Beleg Cuthalion. A great lightning strike then illuminated the scene, evidencing to Turin that he had slain his friend which caused him to scream aloud in such sadness that it would awaken the orcs. However, Turin and Gwyndor managed to escape the servants of Morgoth. Gwyndor roused Turin, saying he would aid in burying Beleg. This action renewed within Gwyndor the strength and virtue of his people, so he guarded and guided Turin away from the area where he had committed his most heinous deed to date. He brought him to the pools of Ivrin, where the madness of Turin was cured, allowing him to weep for all the woe he had wrought upon those he had loved. At this point, Gwyndor bestowed upon Turin the blade Anglachel and asked the Edain to come with him to his home, Nagathrond. Due to the standing Gwyndor previously held within the kingdom, Turin was accepted into the kingdom of Orodreth. He took upon himself a new name, Agarwain, son of Unmath, which in the Sindarin tongue meant bloodstained, son of ill fate. He did so in the hopes that he would be able to mask his identity and so avoid the dark cloud which held perpetual sway over his family. The finest smiths available within the halls of Nagathrond then reforged Anglachel, and in the process, a new name was required for the blade to remove the taint the blade now bore following the death of Beleg. The blade therefore came to be known by the name Gurthang, or Iron of Death in Sindarin. As Turin embodied all that made the House of Hador foremost among the Edain of those days, the attention of the daughter of Orodreth, Finduilas, was drawn to him. 
Yet despite her beauty, Tyrion spurned her advances, as she had once been his friend Gwyndor's beloved before his imprisonment. As Gwyndor's star continued to wane within the kingdom, the man he had brought from the brink of madness assumed an ever more prominent position within Nargothrond, becoming a counsellor to Orodreth. Although he was now in adulthood, Tyrion had never fully tempered the rage and darkness within, and his thoughts turned ever northwards. Turin advocated for an abandonment of the secrecy that had allowed the kingdom to survive in the aftermath of continued setbacks against the Dark Lord. Turin's bold defiance of the norms that had served the kingdom's people for so long soon got him the ear of the more prominent elves of the kingdom, with Orodreth foremost among them. This drew the ire of Gwyndor, who had witnessed firsthand the strength of the Dark Lord and the cruelty he could bring to bear if sufficiently challenged. As a result, the two friends were put at odds with one another in the council meetings of the king, and in time, Gwyndor would come to rue the decision which had brought the son of Hurin to his home. For Turin's words, passionate as they were, came to win the day and spur the king to action. Though mortal men have little life beside the span of elves, they would rather spend it in battle than fly or submit. The defiance of Hurin Thalion is a great deed, and though Morgoth slay the doer, he cannot make the deed not to have been. Gwyndor's hard-won wisdom was thus ignored, and his position among the king's counsellors was diminished. Ordreth, inspired to act against the great foe of his people, prepares to meet the Dark Lord's forces once more in the field and strike a significant blow against the darkness which now engulfed much of North Beleriand. A great collection of arms was amassed within the halls of Nargothrond. At the urging of the still-disguised Turin, a masterfully wrought bridge was constructed to provide a crossing over the Narog from the doors of Felagund. This would allow much hastier travel of warriors to the guarded plain, where most of the fighting was to take place. In this period, Gwyndor fell even further into disrepute due to his undeserved reputation for cowardice and the infirmity which continued to plague him from the wounds inflicted upon him within the depths of Angband. By contrast, Turin had grown into the fullness of his manhood, and his physical strength and courage drew the admiration of all within the kingdom. To ensure a stray arrow did not fell their valiant champion, Turin was outfitted with masterwork dwarven armor, and within the depths of the armories of Nargothrond, Turin found for himself a gilded dwarven war mask. Turin, having donned this array of impenetrable armaments, would instill such fear among the orcs that they would flee without even giving battle. Despite all preparations, the forces of King Orodreth stood as naught more than a flickering flame before the impending crescendo of Morgoth's vengeance upon the House of Hador. For some five years after Tyrion had arrived within his halls, a warning came from the Vala Ulmo himself through messengers of Círdan of the peril in which the kingdom now found itself. Unfortunately, Turin, who had assumed the role of commander of Nagathron's armed forces, counseled against a tactical retreat and the dismantling of the bridge, believing that the forces amassed could now stand against any host Morgoth could bring to bear. Soon after the messengers who had borne such warnings to Nagathron had departed in search of Turgon of Gondolin, an orcish host had moved against the men of Brethil, routing them and slaying their lord Handir. In doing so, they secured the crossings of Tyglin, and so the Dark Lord's hosts could amass reprisals in the Pass of Syrian without fear. Here a vast horde of orcs was gathered, with Glaurung, the father of dragons, at its head, and with the coming of autumn, the people of Nargothrond were to know the wrath and malice of the Dark Lord. First, the great Drake despoiled the Ithil Ivrin, followed by the burning of the Taleth Durnan as he passed into the guarded plain of Nargothrond. The elves of that fair kingdom would not bend in the face of such overwhelming odds, and with Turin at their head, they met their foe in the field. However, Glaurung's might in those days was so great that none but their mighty Edain captain, by virtue of his dwarven armor, could stand before the dragon. For upon the fields of Tumhalad, the forces of Nagathrond were routed. The pride and might Turin had instilled upon the elves of that kingdom withered as fruit upon the vine, and before the day was at its end, Orodreth himself lay dead upon the field of battle. 
Gwyndor too was mortally wounded, and if not for the intervention of Turin, for all fled before his might with great haste, his life would have come to a brutal end at the hands of the orcs. Bearing away his friend, Turin was forced to leave him to his fate as Gwyndor lay the blame of that bloody day at his feet and tasked him with saving his beloved Finduilis. Now, if thou love me, leave me. Haste thee to Nagathrond and save Finduilis, and this last I say to thee, she alone stands between thee and thy doom. If thou fail her, it shall not fail to find thee. Farewell." Making with all haste possible and gathering to him what elves still remained, Turin arrived too late to save the kingdom of Nagathrond. For the bridge he had advocated for and shown such pride towards was to be the unmaking of the people he had been tasked with defending, as it was so finely wrought that it could not be quickly dismantled. Glaurung, with the full force of his flame, brought low the doors of Felagund, and a brutal and bloody sack ensued. The remaining garrison was routed, while the women of Nagathrond, Finduilas among them, were taken captive, intending to bring them to Angband. Turin already failed the kingdom by allowing the shadow of his doom to bring such a mighty people low, and he could not countenance its survivors facing the immeasurable anguish of Angband. The bearer of the dragon helm of Dor Lomin drove back all who dared face him, and their number was few to begin with, as naught more than a handful dared to face this son of Hurin in his full might. However, the curse of Morgoth was not so easily evaded. As he made his way towards the captives, Turin suddenly found himself alone upon the bridge as his companions had either fled or been slain in the desperate attempt to recover the enslaved. Just as it seemed Turin would be able to save the womenfolk, Glaurung emerged from the doors of Felagund at Turin's back and spoke, drawing away the warrior's attention. Turin's eyes bore a great flame within them and reflected upon the edges of Girthang as he stood alone yet unafraid and returned the great dragon's gaze, which was to prove his undoing. Glaurung was a being of immense strength yet his guile and capacity for deception were the sharpest of the talons available to him, and Turin was transfixed as if turned to stone by the witchcraft of the great drake's eye. Unable to move, Turin was forced to endure the vile machinations of Glaurung, who spoke vile mistruths that the Edain believed wholeheartedly due to the spell which now lay upon him. The dragon then gave a signal, and the orcs drove their captives as cattle across the bridge, among them Finduilas, who cried aloud and reached out for the unmoving Turin. However, the dragon would only release Turin when the captives were far from his reach. As soon as the bearer of the dragon helm was released from the dragon's glare, he cast himself at his great foe. Glaurung initially attempted to dissuade Turin from such action by speaking of the immediate peril his mother and sister now found themselves in, yet this was not sufficient and Turin struck out with his black blade, attempting to take the dragon's eye. Glaurung moved with speed, belying his great size and avoiding the blow. He was impressed with the courage of the lone man he now faced. Speaking naught more than poison once more into the ears of this mighty Edine, he convinced Turin to leave Fenduilis to her fate. Haste you now, son of Hurin, to Dor Lomin, or perhaps the orcs shall come before you once again. And if you tarry for Finduilus, then never shall you see Morwen or Nianor again, and they will curse you." Turin turned and sped away to the north to save his mother and sister, which drew a laugh from the great dragon who had achieved the aim of his lord through such a masterful deception. In the act of symbolic desecration, Glaurung destroyed the very bridge which had brought low the kingdom of Nagathrond and made a hoard of the great wealth which had been amassed there, resting upon it for a while. Turin, meanwhile, made his way ever northward, with the poisonous deception of Glaurung still ringing in his ears, despite the coming of a brutal winter. With each step he took, Finduilis's cries of anguish could be heard ever louder, yet the image of Dorlomin, destroyed and his kin slain, drove Turin, son of Hurin, ever closer to his doom. Turin was to return to Dor Lomin. however, this is the story for our next documentary on the history of the First Age. The next few videos in this series 
will be dedicated to the last desperate battles of this age, before the sundering of Beleriand in the War of Wrath. But we are planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes. So make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing, as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.